Tonight we're going to continue in our series, Man in Time and Eternity, uh, going back to the chart. And uh, we have moved beyond the cross and the death and resurrection of Christ. Um, we talked about the present age. Last Sunday we talked about what happens to a believer when they die, that their body goes into the ground, but their soul immediately goes to be with God. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Now I'd like to move to the future and what is coming ahead. What we're going to talk about tonight has not happened yet. We are looking forward to it. And it is on your chart where you see the word rapture. That's where we are uh, this evening. One of my favorite cartoons features three men sitting on a bench. And the outside men are arguing about the end times. One of them is a premillennialist. The other is an amillennialist. And don't feel bad if you don't recognize those terms. We're going to talk about them next week. But while these two are fighting tooth and nail, the guy in the middle is just sitting back calm as can be. And finally, one of the two combatants turns to him and says, what do you think? And he replies, I'm a pan-millennialist. I've never heard of that. What is that? And the guy says, I believe it's all going to pan out in the end. <laughs> That's my kind of eschatology. I'd say over the past 200, or who knows, 2,000 years, no doctrine has received more attention and aroused more curiosity and even controversy than our subject this evening. Furthermore, perhaps at no other juncture of the scriptures have we as Christians missed the point more than what we're going to talk about tonight. And I'm speaking of the return of Jesus Christ. The message I've entitled, The Point of His Return. There have been a lot of books written Charts published, conferences convened on the topic of eschatology, which is a big fancy word for the study of end times, what's going to happen in the end. The Left Behind series, maybe you remember those, a series of novels that uh, popularized uh, this idea, not only for Christian audiences, it made its way up the New York Times bestseller list. And even those unfamiliar with the Bible read those stories and were introduced to the subject. And with people wondering if the world is going to suddenly end by nuclear war, a meteor striking the earth, or some terrible plague wiping out the human race, attention is often drawn to the Bible regarding the culmination of human history. Unfortunately, what has happened is that too many scholars and, and preachers and authors we tend to read back our own culture into the scripture, which was written thousands of years ago. And so when you read uh, some of the imagery of the book of Revelation, you know, where it talks about these locusts coming out and they have, you know, iron breastplates and, you know, uh, stingers like scorpions and blah, blah, blah. And people say, oh, yeah, th those are attack helicopters and, you know, these explosions, oh, those are nuclear warheads. And it's like, okay, what did that mean 2,000 years ago? It certainly didn't mean that. We've missed the point. <laughs> and and we've, we've read back our technology and our culture and even our way of thinking, which I don't believe the Scripture had in mind. Uh, you, you see people trying to identify the Antichrist, and trust me, that's been going on for a long, long time, and they all have one thing in common. They've all been wrong. Same with people trying to predict the date of Christ's return. I mean, how crazy is that? Jesus himself says in the Bible, no man knows the day or the hour, not even me, <laughs> So how is somebody today going to say, well, he's going to come then? Once again, they all have one thing in common. They've all been wrong. They've missed the point. 
That's not why we are given the scriptures about the end. It's not so that we can figure out exactly what's going to happen and when and all of this. Remember before Jesus left the earth, his disciples were like, Hey, Jesus, you're going to restore the kingdom now to Israel? Which, as far as they were concerned, that was the end. You know, this, We're going to do it now? And he said, It's not for you to know the times and dates under the Father's authority, which is a very nice way of saying it's none of your business, right? But, very next verse, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you'll be my witnesses here in Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. So, don't worry about the stuff that's, you know, out of your league. You got a job to do, worry about that. But, it's still there. I mean, the Bible does talk about what will happen in the end. So we got to go back to why it's there. Why did God reveal to us what he did? And I'll be the first to admit, he didn't give us all the details. I'm glad he didn't. But he did put it there for a reason. And that's the point. Now, the upshot of all of this discussion especially a, I'm going to say a generation ago when I was growing up it was at the it was kind of at the heyday I mean there were all kinds of prophecy conferences and you know this that books are being published left and right and and you know it was a craze almost within Christianity what ended up happening is it turned a lot of people off on the subject They didn't want to talk about it. They didn't want to hear about it. They didn't want to think about it. And I was one of them. I got to the point where I'm like, (laughs) if if all these brilliant minds can't come together, you know, if if there's so much disagreement, what's the point, you know? We must not be supposed to know. So why bother with it? So for a long time, I, I just kind of avoided the subject altogether. It's not that I didn't believe Christ would return. I was just fed up with all the arguments that seemed to be proven wrong. But that disenchantment wasn't right. I remember reading a a classic preacher um, named G. Campbell Morgan. He says, it is not fair to turn aside from the subject because of the misinterpretations of those who in their teaching have violated one of the fundamental principles of the New Testament, namely that the hour of the Lord's return is not known nor it can be. But instead of turning aside from the subject, he goes on to say, the very confusion to which I refer should send all students of Scripture back to the Scriptures themselves. In these we will find all the true statement of doctrine rather than in the discussions of the different schools of interpretation. So, that's what we're going to do. We're going to get back into the Scriptures. And I may, along the way, point out where some differences are between interpretations, but that's not the point of his return. That's not why he's coming back. I really want to look at why Jesus is coming. What is he going to accomplish when he returns? And I think that will maybe sort some of the other things out, and maybe we'll find that some of those arguments really aren't all that important. So, if you've got your Bibles, we are going to be turning to a lot of scriptures. We're also going to be putting a lot of the scriptures up here. So, if you're having trouble keeping up, you can read the scriptures up here, maybe jot down uh, where they're from, and uh, if you want to look at them more later on. Also, I want you to know, if you ever want a printed copy of the message, uh, we have those available and, uh, and you can also get those online. One unavoidable truth regarding the culmination of human history is the second coming of Jesus Christ. Even before his first coming, before Jesus was born in Bethlehem, his grand return was predicted in the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7, beginning in verse 13. Daniel says, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, 
glory, and sovereign power. All peoples, nations, and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Daniel is predicting the ultimate coming of the Messiah, the conquering king. He's looking all the way past Bethlehem, past Golgotha, past the empty tomb, all the way to the very end when Jesus will come in what I'm calling the grand return. Now, Jesus himself picked up on this in Matthew 24. Matthew 24. Matthew 24 is a very important chapter when dealing with the study of the end times because the disciples came to Jesus and said, Lord, what are the signs of your coming and of the end of the age? And he gives them the answers in chapter 24. And in that chapter, we read in verse 30, At that time the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and all the nations of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. I believe he was intentionally using the language of Daniel because his Jewish disciples would have understood this. Oh yeah, we've heard that before. Oh, that's what Daniel was talking about in his prophecy some 700 years before. And so Jesus connects these. Even uh, during his trial before the Sanhedrin in Mark 14, 62, he says, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming in the clouds of heaven. All right? So these things that Daniel started, so to speak, the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven, Jesus repeats this and reiterates that. When Jesus eventually ascended into heaven in Acts chapter 1, verse 11, there's two angels that are there and they say, Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking in the sky? This same Jesus who was taken from you into heaven will come in like manner as you've seen him go. How did he go? It says that he went up and a cloud hid them from their sight. So how's he going to come back? He's going to come back in the clouds and then everybody will see him. All of these scriptures are connected. And then in the book of Revelation, very first chapter, chapter 1, verse 7, look, he is coming in the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him and all the peoples of the earth will mourn before him. There's definitely a thread that is running through Old and New Testament that Christ is going to come and he's going to come in the clouds of heaven. Of course, that's the first heaven on our chart, our atmosphere, okay? He's going to come in the clouds and people are going to see him. This is a fundamental teaching throughout the scripture. Every New Testament writer makes reference to the fact that Christ is coming again. And the Apostle Paul, in particular, expounds on Christ's grand return throughout his letters. We're going to spend quite a bit of time in one passage, and that is 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Paul begins in verse 13. Brothers, We do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep. Now, he's not talking about those who nod off in church. Okay, that was a euphemism back then for those who have died. All right, so I don't want you to be ignorant about those who have physically died, wondering where they're at and what's going to happen to them. Or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep or died in him. 
According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Okay? Now, I must insert at this point that many notable teachers and scholars teach a twofold return of Christ. I am one of them. This chart depicts a twofold return. The first part, you could say, of his return, he comes in the clouds, and that's as far as he gets. What we're talking about here, Jesus comes in the clouds, and all the believers actually go up to be with him. At this time, he does not come to the earth. He's only coming in the clouds. We are going to see later when he comes and comes all the way to the earth. And I do believe that is a separate occasion. Now, there are some who say it's all together. He comes in the clouds, all the believers meet him, and then we all come back to the earth. I'm not going to get into all those differences. All right. The way I understand scripture, it's distinct. But I'm not going to say that they're wrong because we don't know. But what you're going to hear from me is a distinction between when Christ comes in the clouds at what's called the rapture and when he comes what is often called the second coming of Christ to earth when he comes to establish his kingdom. So I hope that doesn't confuse but at least clarifies that a little bit. Now, the Bible is clear that the grand return of Jesus will produce glorious results. And the first is identified here in verse 16. The dead in Christ shall rise first. This is the resurrection of the faithful. Simply put, those Christians who put their faith in Jesus will be raised to life and given a glorified body. Jesus himself promised this back in John 5, verses 28 and 29. He says, Do not be amazed at this, for the time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good will rise to live. Those who have done evil will rise to be condemned. But I want you to note that this doesn't all happen at once. There are two distinct resurrections. Okay, And this is made very clear in Revelation 20, verses 4 through 6. Now, we're going to get into Revelation 20 a lot more when we talk about the millennium. But this is prior to that. In Revelation 20, beginning in verse 4, I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony for Jesus, because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads and on their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Notice the first part of that sentence. They came to life. These are Christians who were dead. Now they are brought back to life. Verse 5, in many translations, is in parentheses. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years are ended. Here's the separation of the resurrections. And John goes on to say, this is the first resurrection. So, when Christ comes and the believers are caught up, they are, the dead are raised this is the first resurrection. This is the resurrection of believers. The rest of the dead, the unbelievers, will not be raised until the end of the thousand years. So there is a distinction between. 
there's not a situation where everybody is raised from the dead at once and then they're separated out. I'm confused. Okay. Yes. He goes right away to Abraham's tomb. Okay, it's good good question. We had talked about last week how now that Christ has risen and ascended to heaven, when a believer dies, their spirit goes immediately to be with God. And that is true. This is talking about the spirit and soul being reunited with their body. All right. The believers that have died as of right now their bodies are still here on earth their soul and spirit is with the lord in heaven when christ comes the bodies of the dead will be raised and in a sense reunited with their soul and spirit but it's not the same bag of bones that we drag around now it's a glorified body that we will have forever okay that's a very good question uh, because it could be misunderstood. Well, I thought we were already in heaven. Well, the soul is, but they're awaiting a body. When Christ comes, we will have our new bodies. Very good question. Yes? Good question. What about cremation and people that have their ashes scattered? Uh, the same question applies to those who are blown up in war or that die uh, in the ocean and you know their bodies are uh, never never recovered um, God does not have to have the same molecules in order to create our glorified bodies so our bodies will be raised from wherever and again they are going to be glorified now they're recognizable you know, when Jesus came back from the dead, they saw who he was and they could see who he was, but his body was different. It wasn't the exact same body. This is a glorified body that will never be sick, never die, never age. Um, so we'll have our glorified body at that point. Okay. So when Christ comes, the soul and spirit of the believer come with him and are reunited with their glorified body. All right, so this is the first resurrection, uh, and the second resurrection will come much later. Now, what about Christians that are alive when Jesus comes in the clouds? Paul goes on in verse uh, 17, back in uh, 1 Thessalonians 4. It says, After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air. So in the twinkling of an eye, it's going to be very, very quick. The dead in Christ are raised in their glorified bodies. Those who are still living, that are believers, their bodies will be changed. And in a split second after the dead are raised, the living Christians will also be caught up together. So everybody goes. Those who have died before that time when Christ comes will be raised, and those who are alive that are following Christ will also be caught up in the clouds. But they will go through a transformation as well. If Christ were to come, just for the sake of argument, if he were to come right now, the dead believers would be raised first in their eternal bodies. We would also be caught up with the Lord in the air, but not in these mortal bodies. Paul explains that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 has more truth about the resurrection and our resurrected bodies than any other chapter in the New Testament. In 1 Corinthians 15, I'm going to begin in verse 42. This is a kind of a longer section. So it will be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable, it is raised imperishable. 
It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. What he's saying here is it's just like when you plant a seed in the ground. What comes up is not the seed, but it's what the seed produces. And in the same way, you know, if you think of planting a body in the ground when it's buried, when it comes up, it's not going to be the seed it's going to be what that seed produces. It's going to be different. And he describes that as imperishable, glory, power, and a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, then there is also a spiritual body. So it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being, the last Adam, a life-giving spirit. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural, and after that, the spiritual. The first man was the dust of the earth, the second man from heaven. As was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth. As is the man from heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. And just as we have borne the likeness of the earthly man, meaning we have a physical body, so shall we bear the likeness of the man from heaven, being Jesus. I declare to you, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, again, physically die, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the, the mortal with immortality." When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true, death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? So all Christians will have a glorified body similar to Christ after his resurrection. And that's one of the glorious results of his return, the resurrection of the faithful. Now the second, if we go back to 1 Thessalonians 4, we see in verse 17, after that we who are alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. There will be a reunion of the family. And this is a family reunion like no other. (laughs) This is going to be all the believers All the way back to Abel, all of the believers, we will be raised, we will be changed, we will have our eternal bodies, and we will meet the Lord together in the air. So all of your family members, all of your friends that have gone on to be with the Lord, we're going to be reunited with them one day. We're going to be together with them. We will be with them forever. Jesus spoke of this back in Matthew 24, verse 31. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of the heavens to the other. That's their way of saying the whole earth. The four corners of the earth, so to speak. All four directions, north, south, east, and west. All the believers will be gathered together at that time. Christ alludes to this in Matthew 8, 11. I tell you that many will come from the east and the west and will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. What is he saying here? He's saying it's not just for Jews. Many will come from outside the Jewish people and they will sit down to a huge family feast. Just think about this. One day we're going to meet Abraham. We're going to meet Moses. We're going to meet David, Elijah. We're going to meet Peter and James and John. All the people, the the Apostle Paul. We're going to meet them one day. We are all going to be together with them. We'll meet believers throughout time like Martin Luther and John Wesley. People we've read about. People that maybe have inspired us but we never knew in this life. We're going to be with them. And we're going to be with them forever. Thirdly, the return of the Lord will bring about the reward of the fruitful. 
Jesus states in Revelation 22, 13, Behold, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give it to everyone according to what he has done. Now notice, that's reward. We're not talking punishment here. This is reward for what we have done for Christ in our Christian lives. Now, we've talked about this a little bit tonight already, but in 2 Corinthians 5.10, We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due for him than the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Now, this isn't the same as the judgment of the lost. We're going to see that in a few weeks. This is the judgment seat. It comes from the Greek word bima, which was kind of the metal stand of the Olympics, you might say. It was used back in the ancient Olympic Games, and that's where the winners were presented their laurel wreaths, their crowns. That's what the judgment seat of Christ will be. Salvation is not an issue here. We are evaluated for our service to Him. Paul explains that in 1 Corinthians 3, verses 11 through 15. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If any man builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, his work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. If what he has built survives, he will receive his reward. If it is burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. So here is what happens at the judgment seat of Christ. All of the things we do as believers, not our sins, we're not talking about our sins. Everything we do as believers is going to be put to the test of fire. Now what happens if you have a stack of wood and hay and straw and you put a match to it goes up in flames it burns up and there's nothing left but what happens if you take gold or silver or precious stones and you put them under intense heat do they burn up no actually they purify (laughs) they're actually made even better than they were before because all the impurities are burned away And what Paul is saying here is what we do for Christ is going to last. But the things we do just for ourselves, the things we do in the material realm, they're going to burn up. We're not going to carry those things with us into eternity. Much as I love that little car in the parking lot, it's not going to make it to heaven. Much as I'd love to drive in the pearly through the pearly gates and down the streets of gold and that little bug. It ain't going to be there. And that's true of all of the stuff of earth in our lives. Now, it doesn't mean it's wrong. It doesn't mean it's bad. It just means it's temporary. But if our allegiance is to the stuff, when we get to the judgment seat of Christ, it's all going to burn up, and we're just going to be there empty-handed. But the things we do for Christ, the things we do in serving others, in helping others come to know him, that's the gold and the silver and the precious stones. That's going to last. We're going to have a reward. I don't know what that reward's going to be, okay? I really don't. But we are going to be rewarded. We do know that much. The New Testament does mention some of the rewards awaiting the fruitful Christians. Paul mentions the victor's crown in 1 Corinthians 9 and in 2 Timothy 2. Peter speaks of the crown of glory in 1 Peter 5. The crown of life appears both in James 1 and in Revelation 2. And Paul refers to the crown of righteousness in 2 Timothy 4. Whether these are all designations of the same thing or if this is even a complete list of the rewards, we don't know that. But according to Revelation 4.10, we're going to lay all our crowns at the feet of Jesus. So maybe that's what it is something to give back to him. But we will be rewarded. Now, while these 
glorious results of Christ's return are wonderful, let's not neglect the great responsibility it also brings. Some believe that our responsibility is to interpret the signs of the times. They base that out of Matthew 16. A close reading of that text, however, reveals that Jesus is not talking about signs of the end times. He was talking about the signs of his first coming. He was telling the Jewish leaders, you got the scriptures. You should have known I was coming, and you didn't. In fact, scripture is clear that the precise timing and details cannot be known by us. Going back again to Matthew 24, he makes this so clear and How we've missed this point, I don't know, but we have a propensity to do that. Matthew 24, beginning in verse 36. No one knows about the day or the hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the handmill, one will be taken and the other left. This is where left behind gets their uh, title. Therefore keep watch because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. Does it get any clearer than that? Anybody that says they know when Christ is coming back are going against the scripture. They're not worth the time of day. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So also you must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour you do not expect him. Who then is the faithful and wise servant? whom the master has put in charge of the servants in the household to give them their food at the proper time, it will be good for that servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. We don't know when Christ is coming. We don't know if he will come tonight or many years from now. He may not come in any of our lifetimes. We don't know. But we can always be ready. That's the great responsibility we have, to be ready. And when it comes to the chronology and and what must happen, this is something, frankly, my dad and I never came to an agreement on. He held to one view of the sequence of events. I hold a different one. That's okay. I always told him one day, you know, we'll figure out that I was right, you know. That's not really important. I remember back in Bible college asking a professor, uh, if you don't believe that Jesus could come immediately, you know, that takes away from this idea of the imminence of Christ's return. And he says, not really. He says, Jesus may not come today for all of us, but he may come for you. I don't know if that, you know, he's hoping for that, or I don't know, but... But, but that's true. If you think about the coming of Christ on an individual basis where he says, it's time to come home. None of us knows the day or the hour we're going to die. And that could happen at any time, regardless of when Christ comes for all of us. So we've always got to be ready. So many of Christ's parables were about being ready, being faithful doing what you're supposed to be doing so that if he comes, you're ready for him. If he doesn't, well, you just keep on serving him until he does, either for you or for all of us. After the resurrection, I think I'd mentioned this earlier, the disciples asked Jesus about the timing of his return, the restoration of the kingdom, and he says, it's not for you to know. The times or dates the Father is set by his own authority, but... You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you'll be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. The details of my return, he's saying, are none of your business. But what is your business is fulfilling the Great Commission. And I don't think that connection is coincidental. 
Jesus connected his return to the fulfillment of the Great Commission. And I think that goes back to something else Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 14. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Maybe the reason why nobody knows the day or the hour is that it's not some day and an hour that's set, but rather it's when the church finishes the job. When we have taken the gospel to all parts of the earth, when everybody has had the chance of hearing about Jesus, that's when the end will come. Maybe that's what Peter meant when he said in 2 Peter chapter 3, we can speed his coming. Really? We can speed the coming of the Lord? Apparently so. And I believe the way we do that is by fulfilling the commission. Doing what Christ has instructed us to do. Now, how will we know when that happens? I like the way one scholar put it. The answer is, I do not know. God alone knows the definition of terms. I can't precisely define who all the nations are. Only God knows exactly the meaning of evangelize. He alone, who told us that this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached to the whole world as a testimony to all nations, will know when that objective has been completed. But one thing I do know, I know Christ hasn't yet returned, therefore the task is not yet done. When it is done, Christ will come. Our responsibility is not to insist on defining the terms of the task. Our responsibility is to complete it. So as long as Christ doesn't return, our work is undone. Let's get busy and complete the mission. That, my friends, is the point of his return. That's the point that we often miss. We're so caught up in this is going to happen, that's going to happen, and this and then and this and, you know, these things have to take place first and blah 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 we've missed the point the point is do your job and then i'll come and the quicker we do the job the quicker he comes seems pretty simple to me another writer says preoccupation with the sequence of events and concentration on the geography or schedule of the end times carry such fascination for us that we easily neglect these more compelling issues. Yeah, yeah. you think somebody's behind all of that? It's the one who doesn't want to see that mission accomplished. He's going to try to distract us, just like Peter got distracted by the winds and the waves. If Satan can get us distracted by all these arguments and all these discussions and the charts and the this and the that, he's accomplished his job. I I think one of the most important passages on the second coming, and we're going to end with this, 2 Peter chapter 3, 2 Peter chapter 3, beginning in verse 11, Peter has just described what's going to happen at the end. The day of the Lord will come like a thief, the heavens will disappear with a roar, the elements will be destroyed by fire, everything in it will be laid bare, so whoa, that's the end. But then he gets to the point. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? I like how the King James puts that. How shall we then live? That's the point. The doctrine of Jesus' return should motivate us to action. Not to debate. Not to speculation. It should prompt us to get ready. He answers his own question. What kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. That's what we need to be doing. We don't need to write more books. We don't need to attend more conferences and listen to more podcasts and make more charts. We need to be doing our job. We need to be living in such a way that when Christ comes, 
will be ready. You see, the hope of Christ's return is not a dogma to tickle our brains, but a fact to change our lives. Whenever the Bible speaks of Christ's second coming, its purpose is always to challenge us to action. How should we live in light of his coming? By living holy lives, fulfilling the great responsibility we have to tell others about him. Now, you may be disappointed that I didn't answer all the questions about the second coming of Christ. Because I believe if we get too caught up in the details, we'll miss the point of his return. God did not send us on a wild goose chase, leaving us little clues along the way so we can determine the specifics. The point of Christ's return is that he is returning. Since he is coming, we ought to be ready. How do we do that? By being about the master's business, bringing in the lost. Let's get busy and complete our mission. All right, I know we've gone a long time, but I will take any questions that you might have. Yes, yes. God, God knows all that we have done, good, bad, otherwise. And I think we're all going to be surprised at the judgment seat of Christ. Many of us are going to say, man, I'm not going to get anything. And I think we're going to be surprised at how many little things in life that maybe we didn't even think about, didn't really register. And Jesus is going to say, that person you helped, you did, you did that to me. And so I, I think we're, we're probably all going to have more rewards than we really anticipate because we forget those things, but God never does. All right, let's close in a word of prayer. Father, you have given us your word not to scratch the itch of our curiosity, but to change our lives. And I pray the truth of Christ's coming will do exactly that. That it will motivate us to live for you, to tell others about you, and to even speed the coming of your Son. May we go from this place prepared to act, to do, and may you be glorified through our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.